بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله العليم الخبير المتقن نظام العالم بلا معين ونصير فسبحان الذي حكمته بالغة وعلمه غزير ونعمه واصلة إلى كل صغير وكبير ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له في نقير ولا قطمير ونشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا محمد عبده ورسوله الذي هدانا بكتاب منير ودعانا إلى الله بالإنذار والتبشير صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ما دامت الكواكب تسير أما بعد فقد قال الله جل وعلا في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد خلقنا الإنسان في أحسن تقويم وقد أخرج البخاري ومسلم في صحيحيهما عن أبي عبد الرحمن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه قال حدثنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وهو الصادق المصدوق إن أحدكم يجمع خلقه في بطن أمه أربعين يوما نطفة ثم يكون علقة مثل ذلك ثم يكون مضغة مثل ذلك ثم يرسل إليه الملك فينفخ فيه الروح ويؤمر بأربع كلمات بكتب رزقه وأجله وعمله وشقي وسعيد فوالله الذي لا إله غيره إن أحدكم ليعمل بعمل أهل الجنة حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل النار فيدخلها وإن أحدكم ليعمل بعمل أهل النار حتى ما يكون بينه وبينها إلا ذراع فيسبق عليه الكتاب فيعمل بعمل أهل الجنة فيدخلها أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم My respected brothers, elders, mothers and sisters and all our listeners Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh at the outset, inshallah, before we recap with regards to the last hadith which we have studied regarding the foundation of Islam and the five pillars of Islam, I would just like to mention as a preface and a preamble that last week in South Africa, we had a famous Sira Jalsa. So every year since the last 11 years, I remember the first time we had the Sira Jalsa, I was in my Mishkat year, my second last year. And Alhamdulillah, we were part of the first Sira Jalsa they ever had since this, mashallah, yearly Sira gatherings they have. So Alhamdulillah, different speakers and well, world-renowned scholars came and shared their thoughts and different aspects of Sira. But more particularly, I would like to share my own honorable teacher and my own Ustad, Mulana Suleiman Mullah, Sheikh Suleiman Mullah. He had a two-hour speech on Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life and different dimensions throughout the last 12 years or 11 years, I think they're having the Sira Jalsas. But one aspect I would like to mention and correlate with the, the global circumstances and situation this Ummah is facing. Mulana has mentioned that a few days ago before this Jalsa, uh, at night, just before resting or just before going to bed, Mulana was very restless. He was very uneasy and he was constantly thinking about the global situation and circumstances the world, not only the Muslim world, the whole world is facing. And there was a flush of different verses of the Quran, different answers and different aspects of ahadith which used to come to the mind. And a person can take a lot of counseling from that and a lot of satisfaction and contentment. However, because this thing constantly kept bothering one and he mentions this in the Sira program, he said, I performed two units of salah, optional salah, the nocturnal prayers, the hajjud salah. And thereafter, I gave a little bit of sadaqah. So alhamdulillah, we have this, uh, which we mentioned previously as well, that amongst our culture and tradition is that anything, for indeed charity, uh, it extinguishes the anger and the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Mulana read the two units of prayer and then he gave some sadaqah, some charity. He went to rest, he went to bed, he fell asleep, and before he went to sleep, he made this dua. He said, Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, show me the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in my dream. And this has been the constant dua of his beloved mother. And students who studied with Mawlana, we are very aware 
the great role Molana's parents played in Molana's progress throughout his academic year and he speaks very high about his parents which inspires us as well how to treat our parents because generally the theoretical aspect we always hear through the khutbas and the durus and the ta'aleem and the fadail and many a times we listen to these lectures where they're speaking about how we should be treating our parents but to practically see someone I still remember in our fourth year when we were doing Quran Tarjama with Mawlana the last ten ajza from Surah An Kabut Terminal Jinnati Wan Nas Surah Nas and then in between sometimes Mawlana, Mawlana's mom would call maybe just like don't forget to get the medicine uh, don't forget to get something or just general dua Mawlana would pick up the phone he would take permission and the way he would he would reply to his mom and the way he would answer and the way he would respond to his mom it's like a small child four or five years old who's very obedient boy is like ji ji ami ji ji ma ji ma ami am amin ma amin amin and the amount of time he says amin to the duas and supplications of his mother is like a full tasbih we can literally sit with the tasbih and a full hundred uh, small beads of tasbih that's how Monana interacts and respects and is obedient to his parent. And so Monana's mom always used to make this dua, the many multiple amazing dua she make. She always used to make dua that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you this blessing that you see the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the dream and more particularly you see Umar ibn Khattab. And I'm sure those who have heard Monana's lectures and his series on Umar radiallahu anhu, Allah Akbar Kabir are there for hours but it's just like it's overwhelming, it's absolutely amazing amazing inspiring it increases the person's iman a great in-depth and insight to this great legend and luminary of Islam Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu so Mawlana made this dua and he went to bed subhanallah wa bihamdihi Mawlana sees in his dream not the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam not Umar radiallahu anhu he sees in his dream that he is teaching the Sahih Muslim he is teaching the Sahih Muslim, the famous book of Imam Muslim Rahimahullah. Today's hadith is also narrated by Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah. I think very brief synopsis was given with regards to the uh, great scholar Imam Bukhari. And we spoke about Imam Muslim Rahimahullah as well because this was the first hadith of Imam Nawawi which he narrates in his 40 uh, uh, hadith. So he sees himself in his dream that he is teaching the Sahih Muslim. Now, the interpretation, and remember my respected brothers and elders, there will be some hadith speaking more specifically about dreams, the whole concept of dreams. Just a few days ago, I was seeing uh, one book of Imam uh, Muhammad ibn Sirin, rahimahullah. He was a master and he was an authority when it came to interpretation of dreams. A few days ago, a few weeks ago, one, one, one person messaged me from back home and said, can you do interpretation of dreams? So I, I, we generally, scholars always say, when it comes to interpretation of dreams, or when it comes to these amaliyat, you literally need experience. So it doesn't mean if a person is graduate of a Darul Uloom, he's done takhassus fil fiqh wal ifta, he's done some sort of specialization cause, so he can, inter interpretation of the dream, of a dream, is very sensitive. It comes after a lot of experience, a lot of piety, a lot of divine inspiration. So we always, back home, used to always refer to our senior scholars, because, why? Let me narrate the hadith of Tirmidhi, second volume. Imam Tirmidhi rahimahullah narrates a hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, when a person sees a dream, this dream or the interpretation of this dream is in between the feet of a bird. Is in between the feet of a bird. As soon as he mentions it to someone, the person who listens to this narration of the dream, however he interpretates it, the bird drops the dream. That's how it's going to happen. So it's very, now these are, oh, subhanAllah, this is just the verbatim translation. There is amazing concept and theory behind dreams and its interpretation. But just coming back to the incident of our Ustad, he sees in his dream that the Prophet, he sees himself that he is teaching the traditions and the ahadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam compiled by none other than Imam Muslim rahimahullah ta'ala. He gives the interpretation of this is that look, let, let, let's, let's contextualize the whole, the whole situation and scenario. He is anxious and this anxiety takes him over him that look at the situation of the world. COVID-19, great scholars have passed away and we won't forget inshallah to mention the few in today's gathering more specifically someone who we have announced uh, to three or four salahs. Our Imam Sahib, Muhammad Muhammad Sahib also mentioned it in the Shamail Dars of Tirmidhi. Uh, uh, Uncle Muhammad Musa who passed away in Zimbabwe. A great contributor to our masjid. Someone regarding whom I was reading again my Ustaz Mulana Suleiman Mullah. How close he was with him. 
for the last decade or so he was his host and the amount of respect and connection he had with scholars Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the opportunity to greatly contribute to our masjid Mu'adh ibn Jabal and as Imam Sab mentioned I'm not speaking about one or two or three thousand my respected brothers and elders Allah bless him and he was one of those person who liked to conceal his good actions Mona Mullah writes over there that he always used to say that Allah made me gave me this opportunity to do charity but my greatest concern is how can I conceal my good actions my good deeds but now he, he passed away so as uh, Mona mentioned mention and revive the good actions and the good deeds of those who have moved on may Allah preserve him may Allah elevate his status and ima subhanallah imagine every good deed we are doing today he opened his bank account constantly he's getting the remuneration from our good actions every salah we perform and we heard the maghrib salah subhanallah in the most melodious and outstanding uh, style and recitation rendered by our imam sab everything he is taking the contribution of every good deed which is going to be performed at masjid muadh ibn jabal this is only one which we mentioning subhanallah he has contributed in asia in africa in europe and you name it may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him the highest of stage and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant him Jannatul Firdaus. So my Ustaz was mentioning that that's contextualized. He was concerned about this pandemic, what's happening with the Muslim Ummah. There's so many different things going on in the world and then he he slept with this, making dua, reciting the few verses of the Quran, giving some sadaqah, performing the Turaqat Salatul Tahajud and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him with this dream where he's reciting Sahih Muslim. The interpretation of this dream is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us connect yourself to the teachings of Muhammad and your problems will be solved. Connect yourself with the traditions, the teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and your problems will be solved. Mulana wakes up and he mentions this in the Sira Jalsa that the greatest befall of this ummah or the greatest catastrophe of this ummah is we have practically lost the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and mashallah through the Shamail lessons and through the different durus and uh, the programs we have alhamdulillah this is the object how can we reconnect the ummah with the true Islam explained to us by the practices of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam Allah Ta'ala mentions لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَا Today we are idolizing some so-called inverted comma celebrities and we think that their lifestyle, their way of achievements, their success, what they have so-called globalized the world through their social media, that's what we need to initiate. My respected brothers and elders, the Quran is informing me and you and the world that your success lies in the lifestyle of Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Moving forward, my respected brothers and elders and mothers and sisters and dear listeners, I have been told specifically that Mufti Sahib, it's not the brothers and sisters who are, uh, the, the brothers and the elders who are listening, the mothers and sisters are also listening. So I have to constantly, if I do forget, Dr. Sahib, so my respected listeners, inshallah, today we will be commencing with the fourth hadith of Arba'een and this whole hadith, a brief, uh, uh, what you call uh, introduction to this hadith would be that one of the greatest beginning of this human being is how he was created if you remember a few months ago a few weeks ago can't exactly recall when we had the program called the, the beginning of the creation and this was basically a small summary of the great work done by Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah known as Al Bidaya wa Nihaya the beginning and the end where Imam Ibn Kathir rahimahullah mentions the beginning of the creation what was first obviously the question of who was before Allah that in itself is incorrect incorrect which we explained it but right from the beginning of the creation of this heavens and the earth and Jannah Jahannam Adam alayhi salatu wasalam and the whole uh, inception of this uh, makhluk and then coming to the end what's going to happen everyone will be dying and passing away and then the folders will be turned and sigillat will be presented and then life after death and then Jannah and Jahannam so he mentions this whole theory of the beginning and the end so similarly in this hadith of Imam Nawabi rahimahullah which he mentions as number four look at the tartib my respected uh, listeners I would like to explain one thing that the beauty of the scholars this is something many people don't realize that uh, in the Quran and the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam 
there is one thing in particular, an academic point, which our scholars have always kept in name, in their minds or in their work. And that is called Rabt Bain Al-Ayat, Rabt Bain Al-Abwaab, Rabt Bain Al-Kutub. Then what's the correlation and the connection of first chapter to the other? Now we mentioned, I think two weeks ago, that there is Tartib Nuzuli and Tartib Qur'ani. That the Tartib, the Qur'an was revealed, and the tartib, how the surahs have been placed in the Quran. We spoke about this. We won't delve into much uh, in, uh, in further, inshallah. Now, now, subhanallah, amazing how scholars have highlighted, and more particularly from our subcontinent scholars. If you want to read on this, read Bayanul Quran of Mulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi, rahimahullah. Now, let's say we got Surah Al Fatiha, then we got Surah Al Iflam Mim, uh, Surah Al Baqarah. From after Surah Baqarah, we got Surah Ali Imran. Now we spoke about the Tartib Qur'ani where the, the, the lengthy surahs are placed first in the Qur'an. But one thing which I didn't mention and I thought inshallah today would be the perfect occasion to mention it, that look at the beauty of the Qur'an. It's not haphazardly or without unmindfulness that we just put Surah Baqarah after Surah Fatiha. No, my respected brothers and elders. What happens is there is an amazing connection between the two surahs. Subhanallah. So, why did Surah Al-Baqarah be placed after Surah Al-Fatiha? There is Rabt Bain Al-Ayat. Okay, the topics which are mentioned in Surah Al-Fatiha are with further explanation and detail explored and elucidated in Surah Al-Baqarah. After Surah Al-Baqarah, looking at the different incidents which have occurred and explained and mentioned, why is Surah Ali Imran mentioned? Because there was a categoric or indirect reference of the family of Isa Islam in the previous Surah. So this whole concept of connection and correlation, why, what connection does this Surah have with the previous one? And this Rabt Bain Al-Ayat, Subhanallah, Imam Razi Rahimahullah, in his tafsir, he has taken this into particular consideration where he mentions Rabt Bain Al-Ayat as well that this verse is placed after this verse can you imagine can you imagine the volume of knowledge ulama have explored just in Quran why this verse comes after this verse there is a connection so so Allah I mean Quran yesterday I was reading a fatwa on one of the websites with regards to an authentic website uh, I, th I think it was Yaqeen Institute uh, so I think I think it was mentioned why is Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah of the opinion Initially, that salah in Farsi language is permissible. So imagine we say, Allah sab se bara hai, tamam tarif yaw salah ke liye hai, jo tamam jahano ka paal ne wa. Imagine if we had to do that in Urdu. Well, I'm not going to Gujarati, definitely. That's going to sound horrible. But I'm saying, imagine this was, this was, the, this was the opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And uh, mashallah, we have our Turkish brothers or, or people who speak the, 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 the Farsi language. Imagine the whole salah in Farsi. Subhanallah. But then, they, they explained that, oh, was Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah against the Arabic language? Was he obsessed with the Farsi language? Was there something particular he wanted to promote? But the correct answer to that is that Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah mentioned, and there are many answers. One, one, one answer, because we're speaking about the Rabt Bain al-Ayat, the correlation and the connection between verses. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, and a great legendary scholar like him, he said the beauty of the Quran in its Arabic is so deep that many a times if you start thinking, contemplating, reflecting, you forget where you are. You forget where you are. Oh, Hazrat, aap to akin hai, namaz ke saath namaz, jamaat ke saath namaz par Imagine if we start thinking and uh, contemplating in the in the tafsir of what, what has been recited in the Quran, the as-sabab nuzul the niqat, and the lughwi tahqiq, and the, and the, and the islahi ta'rif, and then what, what impact it has socially, economically, independently, secretly, publicly, a person will be lost. Imam Sahib to Maghrib ki namaz seedhe isha par khatam karengi. Pata nahi, fajr tak chali jayi. So Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah used to say that because the, the in-depth of the Arabic language and not to forget Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah for 16 years, for 16 years he studied and mastered the Arabic language before he started exploring Quran and Hadith. 16 years only on Arabic and today unfortunately we read the translation of the Quran read the translation of Sahih al-Bukhari and independently we want to come to conclusions and this is what the Quran means according to my understanding I think what Imam Bukhari ya akhi, 
We speak in about 16 years mastering the Arabic language, then taking the audacity, not only exploring the Quran, or not only making big statements as this is my conclusion, rather they saying that, okay, let's try and understand basic aspects of Quran. How many times Imam, Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah made mutala'a, read through the whole Quran, just to understand the evidence and the proof of ijma'. One aspect of the Quran, did he not have sufficient time? Did he not have the latest uh, Quran, Mus'haf's wonderful we have? Did they not have sufficient means? Yes, definitely you have the best Quran on your phones, on your tablets, on your iPads. But 16 years mastering Arabic and then reading the Quran. And he says, I read it the first time, the third time, second time, the third time. The fourth time only Allah gave me an indirect inspiration that this is indirectly a proof and the need that غير سبيل المؤمنين نوله ما تولى ونصله جهنم والله سبحانه وتعالى mentions that whoever does not follow the path of Allah, the path of Rasul, and the path of the believers, indeed he has gone astray. Three times and fourth time coming to this sort of understanding, my respected brothers and elders, it's very immature of us that we come to such conclusions without in-depth knowledge. And we mention in, this, in, the, in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, the adab of questioning. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, Inna Allah ta'ala kariha lakum thalathan. Indeed, Allah dislikes three aspects from you, three matters regarding you. Qila wa qala, unnecessary futile talks, wa kathrat as-su'ali, questioning more and more without any dini benefit in it, wa idha'at al-mal, and obviously spending and uh, wasting, wasting wealth. So my respected brothers and elders, it's utmost important that we learn from these pious predecessors that they gave their life to Islamic studies, Islamic education, exploring the Quran and the Sunnah. So I was mentioning that our scholars of Tafsir have given an amazing explanation of Rabtu Bain al Ayat, that how one verse of the Quran is connecting to the next verse, how one surah of the Quran is connecting to the next surah. Similarly, Muhaddithun have done a similar thing in Ahadith as well. Can you imagine the Bukhari, the, the, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, the Sahih of Imam Muslim? There are many different uh, aspects to their compilation. But one good thing of Imam Muslim Rahimahullah Sahih is that Imam Muslim Rahimahullah in his book, all Ahadith related to one subject are placed under one topic. So Imam, Imam Muslim Rahimahullah, for example, Babu man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala al-jannah, Babu fadail al-iman, Babu al-imanu yazidu wa yanqus, Babu manaqib al-sahaba, whatever it may be. So Imam Muslim Rahimahullah, generally his methodology in his Sahih Muslim is that a hadith which are connected to one bab, he brings it under one. Imam Bukhari Rahimahullah, Allahu Akbar Kabira, both of them have their own individual independent beauty. One hadith would be brought on different different subjects why because Imam Imam Bukhari rahimahullah is trying to prove different different aspects of Sharia so his book shows that's why that's why the famous uh, statement of Allah Yusuf bin Nuri rahimahullah fiqhul Bukhari fi tarajimihi that Imam Bukhari rahimahullah's Madhab, what he would follow, his fiqh, his understanding would be highlighted and notified by the Tarjamatul Bab. Now what is the Tarjamatul Bab? Like for example, we have a hadith in front of us now. Now this hadith has many aspects you can explore on. It speaks about Qadr, it speaks about the human inception, it speaks about how different stages a person goes in the womb of the mother, and it speaks about Jannah and Jahannam. So there are different angles to this hadith. Well, how would you put it as a title? What would you label it as? That's Imam Bukhari rahimahullah's outstanding characteristic of his Sahih al-Bukhari. That Imam Bukhari would look at the hadith and he would say that, you know what, I need to prove a point. And his point would be proven through the title he gives to the hadith. So my respected brothers and elders, this is the fourth, fourth hadith of Imam Nabawi rahimahullah's Arba'in. And why does he bring it? after bunya al-islam ala khamsin that the islamic foundation lies on five pillars so after speaking about the beginning of your religion in this hadith imam rabu is trying to say now understand your beginning o insan we have understood the beginning and the foundation and the strength of Islam, the fundamental aspects of Islam, the pillars of Islam. Now you need to understand what is your beginning o insan so let's read the translation of this hadith abu abdul rahman 
who was the title of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu reported the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most truthful the most trusted told us subhanallah imagine we praise Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who Nabi was like you know this was my prophet this is my prophet he's amazing he's outstanding he's a perfect human being but it's so pleasing when we hear the praises of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam directly from Sahaba because remember my respected listeners Sahaba were not people where they used to uh, inflate a person where they used to unnecessarily praise a person in this day and age if we have to see titles Allah Akbar Kabira if someone, subhanallah, we can give title to whomsoever we want. But I'm saying this was not the culture and the tradition of Sahaba. They wouldn't give, mashallah, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 titles before a scholar's name. We are confused that their name is the first or the second or the third or the name is. Sometimes we get confused what is the name because, mashallah, there are so many titles. This was not the custom of Sahaba and we cannot disagree on this. Yes, they were given some outstanding main titles and we spoke about this. Sheikh Islam. Hujjatul Islam, Sheikhul Hind, and um, many other titles which were given to many of the scholars of the past. But remember, my Ispah, Allah, Akbar Kabira, it comes to mind that Sheikh Muhammad Awama, Allah, I have to mention this, Sheikh Muhammad Awama, Hafidahullah, his wife passed away two days ago. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate her status. She has been a great support in the academic and spiritual progress of Sheikh Awama, Hafidahullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant Sheikh good life, good health, so students like us can constantly benefit from him he resides currently in Turkey however his uh, wife has passed away this week uh, this, uh, this week Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant her Jannatul Firdaus Sheikh Muhammad Awama Hafidahullah has written a kitab where he explains the different titles given to scholars so today this is called Sheikh, he's called Hazrat, he's called Mawlana, he's called Faqih, Hul Asr, he's called Hujjatul Islam. We don't even know what it means because these titles are given just for that person to feel happy. Whether he is, uh, he, th that's, this title belongs to him or not, Allah knows best. However, these true scholars, when they were alive, they were not given these heavy, healthy titles to, mashallah, make them feel ke, anallati sammatni ummi haydara, ke bas hamare baad junaid baghdadi ke baad to hamara hi number hai. They weren't like that. They were very simple, humble, down to earth, non-entities of society. It was the work which the academic work which they gave to the world spoke for themselves and spoke volumes about them. So look at, look at this very simple, very simple and concise and very pragmatic explanation and characteristic of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu has many ahadith, 828-ish ahadith he has narrated from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, the messenger of Allah, the most truthful and the most trusted told us. As-Sadiqul Masluq, the most truthful and the most trusted human being ever to touch this planet Earth was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He told us, verily, the creation of each one of you takes place when he is assembled in his mother's womb. For 40 days he is a nutfa, nutfa translated as drop of fluid. Then he becomes an alaqa, alaqa, a clot of blood for a similar period. 40 days. Thereafter, he is mudga. Mudga is, as mentioned over the piece of flesh. Mashallah, we have Dr. Sab, so I'm sure if I'm going to make any mistake with the translation, Dr. Sab will correct us. So then it comes in a hadith, same, for a similar period, 40 days. So that's 120 days. So in 120 days, three procedures or three process takes place. Then an angel is sent to him. After 120 days when a child is in the womb of the mother, an angel is sent to him, to this person, to this human being, him or her, in this hadith it refers to him, who breathes the ruh spirit into him. So this angel, this malak, this sent messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he blows the spirit, he blows the ruh into this, into this 120 days uh, being. This angel is commanded to write four decrees. Now, the responsibility of this angel is, he writes four things with regards to this fetus. What does it write? He writes down his provision. We are concerned about our provision. It's written before even we came into this world. So he writes down his provision, his lifespan, how many years is going to be on this earth? 
his deeds, everything he's going to be doing in this world, and whether he will be among the wretched or the blessed, meaning he's going to be among the believers and good people, or amongst the disbelievers and as a wretched person. Now this is the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ further continues, I swear by Allah, now my respected brothers and elders, mothers and sisters, generally in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ does not need to take a qasam. He does not need to take an oath. As-sadiqul masduq. We just said it, the most truthful, the most reliable, the most trustworthy and trusted human being. However, when the Prophet ﷺ takes qasam, he takes a yameen, he takes an oath in the name of Allah, it's to emphasize a particular point, it's to show you and me the importance that many a times the Prophet ﷺ would be sitting. And then he gets up. Waylul lil Arab. Waylul lil Arab. Waylul lil Arab. Min fitnatin qadiqtarab. The Prophet ﷺ was sat and then suddenly in front of the Sahaba, he gets up. He was relying and reclining on the, on the pillar. He sits up straight and instantly he reacts by saying that woe be to the Arabs. Destruction is beheading the Arabs. Destroyed are the Arabs. Min fitnatin I am seeing a fitna which is very, very near. It's about to occur in this tribe and in this peninsula. So many a times the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's physical reaction to a particular manner, sometimes the verbal statement, just to wallahi la yandur, wallahi la yandur, wallahi la yandur. Many a times the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, on the day of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa taala will not see that person. Allah will not see that person. Allah will not see that person. Obviously, with the gaze of rahma and mercy. Qila man ya Rasulullah? Who is this person? And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wasallam would further elaborate. So in this, Nabi alayhi salatu wasallam is highlighting. Look what I'm mentioning is very serious. Take heed. Take note of this. I swear by Allah, there is no God but He. There is no Diet or there is no worthy of worship but Allah. One of you performs the deeds of the people of Jannah until there is but an arm's length between him and it. Many a times this insan performs actions and good deeds throughout his life and he's heading towards Jannah. There's literally one arm span, one arm length between him and Jannah. What happens then? When that which has been written will overtake him so that he performs the deeds of the people of the hellfire. And one of you performs the deeds of the people of the hellfire until there is but an arm's length between him and Jahannam. When that which has been written will overtake him so that he performs the deeds of the people of, para of paradise and he enters therein. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, now, now inshallah we speak on this uh, before we go into the depth of this hadith. Very briefly the explanation of this hadith is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the first aspect, there are two paragraphs as you can see inshallah on the slide as well. The first or the top part of the hadith or the first paragraph of the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is speaking about the, about the, the beginning of this insan, about the inception of this insan. As we mentioned, Imam Nawawi brings this hadith on number four, so that there is connection between the foundations of Islam and the foundation of, insa uh, uh, foundation of Islam and the foundations of human being. So in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ explains that this is the tartib and subhanAllah, Quran explains this in much detail and the whole concept of embryology, which we'll be explaining a little bit further, that uh, how science after 1400 years ago have uh, come on the knee and accepted the concept of uh, the pro process and the procedure of how insan comes into existence and how he comes into this wonderful uh, dunya and this world. So let's speak about the second paragraph. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying many a times insan throughout his life, throughout his life, he's performing good actions, good a'mal, good deeds. Uh, he's, he's engaging in everything you can, like you know they say that قِيلَ لِأَحَدِ الْحُكَمَةِ Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda mentioned this in Risalatul Mustarshideen that it was asked one of the wise people and he relates this as a hadith as well and he changes the word of hukama into قِيلَ لِأَحَدِ الْصُلَحَاء So he says that uh, it was asked to one of the wise people أَيُّ جُلَسَائِنَا خَيْرٌ that which of our gatherings are the best or which of our companion is the best like you know like where should we be engaging where should we be congregating where should we be uh, like, like, like getting together ayu julasaina khayrun qala man dhakkarakum billahi ru'yatuhu wa zada fi ilmikum mantiquhu wa dhakkarakum bil akhirati amaluhu 
He mentions three things. He said, Man dhakkarakum billahi ru'yatuhu. You see the person, he reminds you of Allah. You see the person, she reminds you of Allah. Why? Constantly engage. The tongue is moist with the remembrance of Allah. Their actions is so balanced and so calculated that he is always conscious. My Allah is observing my actions. My Allah is watching me. How can I deceive a believer? How can I speak lie? How can I treat someone wrongly? How can I? How can I go against? Uh, the, how how can I betray my own family? How can I be bad to my neighbors? So all these aspects of a believer. You look at him. He's a perfect believer. Man dhakkarakum billahi ru'yatuhu. You look at him. He reminds you of Allah. Wazada fi ilmikum mantiquhu. He opens his mouth. He increases you in the knowledge of Islam. He opens his mouth. He explains you the wonders of Quran and Sunnah. He opens you. He opens his mind. He makes you feel wow. Wow, this is something I am missing and I need to explore about my own tradition and my own culture and my own religion. Wazada fi ilmikum amaluhu. Man zakkarak, man zakkarakum billahi ru'yatuhu. Wazada fi ilmikum man tiquhu. Wazakkarakum bil akhirati amaluhu. His actions are reminding you of the hereafter. Subhanallah. Can you imagine this? I mean, we're speaking about this person who passed away. These kind of people remind you how Allah has blessed them with this dunyawi ni'mat as well as this is an akhira ni'mah. This is a ukhrawi ni'mah. Imagine the man is giving so much charity. And, uh, and I, I heard this from our own, uh, our own Najib bhai. He mentioned that when this person was in, in Leicester who contributed, mashallah, wholesome to our masjid, and then uh, uh, Najib bhai had uh, requested him that mashallah masjid has reached its completion we got just bits and bobs here and there a few aspects and touch-ups left however i would request you very humbly that inshallah you come and see this wonderful masjid which has reached its completion he said that you know what we have done what we had to do and that is to mashallah support as much as i don't want any name and fame I don't need to be recognized. I don't know whether my giving is for the sake of Allah. But again, I'm saying that subhanallah, the, these sort of actions today, unfortunately, we're living in a world, every person needs to be recognized. I need to be known. I cannot be a known entity of society. I should be verbalized on people's tongue. Mashallah, sunnah. Th that's our reality. Whether we're spending less or more, whether we are spending more than someone else or not. But this is how our, our, our nature has become. And we constantly make dua. Allah subhanahu purify our hearts our mind our actions our deeds and make us good Muslims where we can represent our own religion in the best manner so mention in the hadith that his action reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the last part of hadith is hi highlighting this point many a times a person throughout his life he's performing good actions good deeds he's engaged he's involved activities and different faculties however the ending of that person is very detrimental. Let me narrate a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the battlefield, before they engage and they commence the battle and this expedition which they have embarked on, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam speaks about a particular person. He says, this person is going into the fire of Jahannam. Sahaba were, con sahaba were silent, observing, listening attentively. But throughout when the battle started, oh Allahu Akbar Kabira, this person was the greatest warrior and the greatest mashallah fighter they could have ever seen. He's absolutely engaging. He's absolutely uh, ev eye catching. Everyone's like literally their gaze have been encapsulated by this person's action. And they are like full of awe and respect and admiring. Look at this person. But at the same time, the Prophet said, he, innahu finnar. He, he's indeed from the people of so they were a bit like definitely not confused but they were a bit like how should we contextualize this how should we put one and one together how can we put this whole scenario in front of us together subhanallah my respected brothers and elders the statement of muhammad sallallahu alayhi zameen asman ek ho jaye lekin huzur ki baat kabhi galat ho hi nahi sakti hai it's impossible that Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes a statement and that is falsified or it goes incorrect or goes against what he said. What happens during this battlefield? This person is engaged, he's involved, then he gets hurt. Now he could not bear the pain of the severe injury he, he was afflicted with. He couldn't tolerate this. So what did he do? 
he took his sword and he pushed himself over the sword. So what did he do? He did suicide. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, did I not mention that that action is totally against the teaching of Islam and he's in fire. Now I'm not going to go through the whole concept that Islam absolutely disassociates itself with any sort of hurting oneself. It's Do not harm yourself. Do not hurt yourself. Ulama say it's not possible for a person to stand in salah where else his body needs rest and he's praying. Haramun alayk. It's not permissible for you to fast when your body cannot take fasting. It's not possible for you to this. Nabi alayhi salatu was salam, the riwayat of uh, Riyadh al-Salihin. He mentioned that when one of you is tired and sleep overpowers him, do not make dua. Do not make dua. Because you might be trying to attract the mercy of Allah. But because of sleep overpowering you, you might attract the wrath of Allah. So Islam is saying do not harm yourself. Don't, don't, let alone physically being in, uh, hurting uh, oneself. Like mentally as well, Islam does not allow you to hurt yourself. Do not think about things which is going to mentally drain you. It's not permissible. That's why I'm saying, and my teacher mentioned in his Sira program as well, that Islam is the most practical and close to nature religion. It's impossible. So the Sahabi, he was hurt, he was injured, he pushed himself over the sword and he passed away. When the Sahaba saw this, they said, Sadaqallah wa Rasuluhu, Sadaqallah wa Rasuluhu, Sadaqallah wa Rasuluhu. Allah and His Rasul spoke the truth. So, many a times a person is involved in good actions. Look at this, he was a warrior. However, his ending, his ending was so detrimental and heading towards destruction that the Prophet said that he will have to face the repercussion of this action. And let's flip the side. And this is very scary, my respected brothers and elders, mothers and sisters, that many a times a person is sinful. He is performing every evil deed you could have think of or you could have imagined. However, last part of his life, and how many times have you seen this? And we're reminding ourselves again and again not to look down upon anyone. A person is involved in every and any sin you can think of. However, he changes his life at the age of 50, 60, 70. And the same hadith inshallah which I will share with you is a person in a different battlefield, he accepts Islam, he does no other good action or good deed before this, he takes part in this battle and then he passes away. He fought for the sake of Allah, he became martyred, the next step is in Jannah. Whole life he was an Islamic life, he was spending an un Islamic life. So it's very important we always keep this in mind. Respected uh, listeners, inshallah, we move forward. The narrator of this hadith is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. We know his name is Abdullah. His title was Ibn Ummi Abdin. Ibn Ummi Abdin. He was born 23 years after our beloved Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So 23 years after Nabi alayhi salatu wa sallam and he passed away 20 years after our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a shepherd as a boy. Initial days he was working and he used to take the, uh, he used to take the flock of the Quraysh chieftains and he would graze them on the outskirts of Mecca. Ibn Mas'ud remained very closely attached to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He would attend to his need, accompany him on journeys and expeditions, wake him up when he slept. Allah, can you imagine? How, what a great honor. Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, Ibn Mas'ud, I'm going to sleep, I'm having a nap, wake me up. Ya Allah, I wish we had this khidmat. Yani imagine today we get excited when a great scholar, a pious person gives us a small, small khidmat to do. The Prophet I mean, Quran tells Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that in the layli hiya ashaddu wata'a wa aqwa muqila that Ya ayyuhal muzzammil qumil layla illa qalila qumil layla illa qalila stand up in front of Allah at night for a short period of while definitely Night is the time when a person crushes his nafs and he's standing in front of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wants to perform the Tahajjud Salah, which is a divine instruction from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Who becomes a mean for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi to wake up and engage? Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Abdullah, I'm going to sleep, just wake me up for Tahajjud. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu had the responsibility. He would wake him up when he slept, would shield him when he washed. Allahu Akbar Kabira.
Look at this point. Ibn Mas'ud would shield him when he washed. We all aware that back in the days, good 100 and, uh, 1,400 years ago, there was no facilities of mashallah on suit toilet and bathrooms and doors and everything. They would go uh, uh, on the outskirts a bit further away in the dark where no one can see, conceal themselves uh, behind a tree or something, and then they would release or uh, themselves so abdullah ibn masood radiallahu anhu was given this khidmat as well ibn masood you come with me make sure i am going to be busy over here no one should come close by can you imagine what a great honor you like so close you are to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that the prophet alayhi salam for his personal needs and wants he calls abdullah ibn masood radiallahu anhu he would carry his staff and his siwak as well nabi alayhi salam had a stick that was with ibn masood and his miswak as well imagine I bet Ibn Masood so many times must have taken that miswak and like Subhanallah. Ye to huzur ka miswak hai, hum bhi barkat and kuch haato pe lagaye. You know, we speaking about lotion and cream. What better could there be than the saliva of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? This is an example of how many of our scholars were servants of righteous people. Ibn Mas'ud was the first one to recite Quran publicly in Makkah after the Prophet ﷺ. Some important aspects to Ibn Mas'ud, his merits, his virtue. Abdullah, the son of Mas'ud, very knowledgeable. When it came to knowledge, he was very synonymous to knowledge as well. His father passed away before Islam and he was uh, brought up by his mother, Ummu Abdin, who accepted Islam. For this reason, he was attributed to his mom. And we mentioned this as well. Many a times the Arabs would uh, affiliate and attribute themselves to the mother. He accepted Islam uh, and he was the sixth person to accept Islam. Subhanallah. Today we're saying that we 1.2 billion Muslims in the world and throughout the 1400 years, how many? And you know, we always boast about this. Like, you know, I was first to do so, I was second to do so. Ibn Masood could very mashallah proudly say he was the sixth person in the history of islam to accept islam subhanallah allah elevate their status he is amongst those sahaba who has uh, done hijrat who migrated twice abyssinia as well as medina after our prophet sallallahu passed away umar radiallahu sent him as a teacher of quran to kufa uh, where he continued learning and teaching and during the final years of Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu's khilafah he was called back to Medina. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud passed away in 32nd Hijrah in Medina at the age of 60 and today he is buried in Jannatul Baqiyah. Now there are many merits to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud inshallah we will exclude them. Okay. Um, my respected brothers, one point inshallah of this hadith is with regards to uh, embryology in Quran and hadith and I am going to be very cautious because I'm speaking about a topic where we have uh, masters uh, in this field or uh, professors in this field. But just few points inshallah that this hadith describes the stages, stages of the fetus and the creation of man 1400 years before science today has confirmed it as a fact. And, and subhanallah, I think it was Wednesday morning after Salatul Fajr where our respected Dr. Sa was explaining how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the saliva and the whole process and procedure, how this mouth is constantly moist with the saliva and how much of saliva comes out. Allahu Akbar, I'm, I mean, I'm saying, وَفِي أَنفُسِكُمْ أَفَلَا تُبُسِرُونَ Many a times Quran is giving da'wah Why are you not contemplating or why aren't they thinking in the Quran? It looks like there is a lock on their hearts. And this is exactly what we're speaking of. That any aspect of this insan or the creation of Allah, you explore, you would be absolutely amazed. Now, this verse of Quran speaks about the different process of, ins uh, of, this, of this human being in the womb of the mother. So Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِينَ And certainly did we create men from an extract of clay. So we all know that insan mitti se bana hai, mitti mein jayega. And this is the same reason when a person passes away, we're at the graveyard, Qabrastan cemetery, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that pick up the, 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 the soil or the sand and throw it three times. And what do we recite? Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. So the verse of Surah Taha where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that from sand, from soil, we have created you. Wa fiha nu'idukum. We will return you back into sand. Wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. And from it we shall resurrect you on the day of Qiyamah. So our reality, our haqiqat, our asl is mitti. And this is what the Quran is explaining. We have created this man from an extract of clay. 
Now, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُطْفَةً فِي قَرَارٍ مَكِينٍ Then we placed him as a drop of fluid in a firm lodging. Now, obviously, we won't go into the intricacies of this whole procedure, and uh, inshallah, that could be explained in a more uh, academic and, ad and advanced class. ثُمَّ خَلَقْنَا النُطْفَةَ عَلَقَةً Then we made the drop, of flu uh, the, the, the drop of fluid into a cleansing clot. فَخَلَقْنَا الْعَلَقَةَ مُضْغَةً And... We made the clot into a lump of flesh. And we made from the lump bones. And we covered the bones with flesh. Then we developed him into another creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. Now I would like to read this passage of your, uh, uh, from uh, an article and uh, I do not want to make any changes or editing. I would just read it uh, as is inshallah. For me and you to appreciate that there is a kitab written by Mufti Taqisab about uh, Quran says science talk and with regards to Quran and science where can we accept the scientific aspects of uh, uh, Quran where, where, where can we ex accept the aspects of science when it comes to Quran so if Quran mentions a theory and apparently it looks like that the scientific theory goes against the Quran uh, where is the balance where do we strike the balance where can we take from science and where can we say this is the limits we cannot take science from here onwards so inshallah I would just like to quote this um, professor Keith Moore inshallah and uh, I would like to explain how he understands and he accepts uh, and confirms embryology in Quran so professor Keith Moore is one of the world's prominent scientists in the field of anatomy and embryology and is the author of the book entitled the developing human so he wrote a very famous book and this book is called the developing of human and I'm sure those who are into the field of embryology and science, they will appreciate uh, the Muslim students in college universities who are uh, studying in this uh, field. Inshallah, they should uh, read this book because it's written very many aspects in this book are in conformity with the Sharia. And it gives an amazing understanding and amazing dimension of how science proves the concepts of Quran, which I mentioned 1400 years ago. So he mentions in this book, which has been translated into eight languages, subhanAllah. This book has been written and it's translated the development of human or developing human in eight different languages. This book is considered a scientific reference work and was chosen by the special committee in the United States as the best book authored by one person. So subhanallah, it received great rewards for its uh, academic work as well. Dr. Keith Moore is a professor in anatomy and cell biology at the University of Toronto, Canada. And in 1984, he received the most distinguished award presented in the field of anatomy in Canada. So I'm speaking about 1984. Uh, the JCB Grant Award from the Canadian Association of Anatomists. He has directed many international associations such as the Canadian and American Association of Anatomists and the Council of the Union of Biological Sciences. In 1981, now this is the point to keep in mind and highlight inshallah and uh, it brings great pleasure to see mashallah that he was quite honest in his academics as well. In 1981 during the 7th medical conference in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, Professor Moore said, it has been a great pleasure for me to help clarify statements in the Quran about human development. It is clear to me that these statements must have come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam from God or look what he says it must have come to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam from God or Allah as we refer to it because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. How is it possible that a human being who was illiterate in the uh, remote areas of, uh, of uh, Arabian Peninsula, he is explaining the concepts and the theories and the different procedures and process of embryology. So he said it's impossible that this person before so many centuries without any advanced technology and resources could come and tell us about how the whole procedure of this human being is taking place. So definitely it must be from God. Because almost all of this knowledge was not discovered until many centuries later. This proves to me that Muhammad must have been the messenger of Allah. Yahi kalam. Yahi asal kalam. 
that this is something where it's you know, it's impossible and a human being cannot fathom this that if a person that is sincerely and honestly reads the Quran and he has his own academic expertise that he has to accept Islam he has to put in front, he has to put his all all academics aside and say that well this Quran is the book of guidance and is something which is not created from human being rather it's a divine revelation from the Almighty the reference of the uh, for this statement on here okay that's it for a copy of this you should okay consequently professor Moore was asked the following question does this mean that you believe that the Quran is the word of God he replied I find no difficulty in accepting this so this is basically an excerpt my respected brothers and elders with regards to the whole concept that the more scientist explores Quran and subhanallah if you go online and students of um, science will give you a bit more in depth in this as well many many academics have written with regards to Quran and scientific uh, uh, what you call uh, development and how they have explored and at the end of the day it's it's like how Allama Iqbal rahimahullah said that dhundne wala sitaron ki guzargahon ka apne afkar ki dunya mein safar kar na saka jisne suraj ki shuaon ko giraftar kiya dunya ki uh, he he's trying to say Allama Iqbal rahimahullah that how ironic it is that people have claimed to travel to the moon yet they couldn't embark on a journey on their hearts वहाँ तक तो पहुँच गए इतने दूर जाने की जरूरत नहीं दिल ही के अंदर अपने मन में डूब कर पा जा सुरागे जिंदगी लुक डीप डाउन इन योर ओन हार्ट एंड यू विल सी द रियलिटी ऑफ द स्क्रीटर सो माय रिस्पेक्टेड ब्रदर्स एंड एल्डर्स आई जस्ट वांटेड टू मेंशन वन फिक्ही मसला वही है and I'm sure inshallah we won't take much time and that is with regards to fetus and stillborn baby now we have understood the different procedure 40 days is the first process and then the second 40 day there's a bit of reform and development and then the next 40 days 120 days and then the hadith mentions now ruh comes in an angel comes and he blows the ruh now many a times we have this question the, it is for, uh, for the same reason I think uh, two weeks ago we had this question so I thought inshallah I will highlight it with regards to fetus and stillborn baby what is the Shari'i Rooney so a fetus is generally considered to be a child at the second stage of development during pregnancy what does it mean that this is before four months 120 days or uh, as we would regard this as before the ruh coming into this flesh of flesh of uh, uh, of meat before that and before obviously the whole procedure takes place and further now the the livelihood or the life which comes into this person we're not speaking about that point so it, it's mentioned that a fetus and a stillborn child it's basically the second stage now he's past four months is more than 120 days so a stillborn a stillborn is referred to a child that has passed away in the womb and is born deceased so for example after five months 120 more than 120 days six months seven months eight months now the child is born and we call it a stillborn child meaning the child was born and he's a deceased he passed away it has no life in it now what's the Sharia ruling with regards to the stillborn baby the age at which fetus is classified legally as a child is 24 weeks in Islam 24 weeks which is 120 days or as we mentioned four months after that Islam regards this child uh, as a uh, as, as a human being and it regards him as someone who has life if a child is born before the 24th week of pregnancy no legal formalities are applied so there is no sort of implication and you know salatul janaza and all this sort of naming the child and there is no question we take the child we wrap it up and we bury the child if however the child is delivered at or after the 24th week of pregnancy then all legal formalities are applied now let's take some of them as a result of a miscarriage should a fetus have no limb formation visible then do not perform ghusl so now we have a five month old stillborn child what's the procedure so if there are no uh, as mentioned no limbs or no formation or no physical appearance visible uh, like hands and feet and everything then no ghusl should be performed no coffin no shrouding will take place merely wrap the fetus in a cloth and bury it in a, at a cemetery following the appropriate burial procedure so that's it five months old child no uh, physical appearance no forms uh, of a limb or anything visible inshallah the child would be wrapped in a in a cloth and uh, buried accordingly uh, as the cemetery has a whole section of small children or uh, stillborn babies 
And if, uh, as a result of a miscarriage, the fetus has limb formations visible, hands, legs, feet, uh, it's after maybe the eighth month or just the ninth month when many a times it's nine months completed. However, the child is born as a diseased and he's uh, a stillborn child. So the, 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 the physical appearance of the child and the formation is visible, then the fetus will be given ghusl. So ghusl has to be performed. Ghusl has to be performed. And kafan also needs to be given. Now, obviously, I do understand that the kafan is not going to be like how we have normally for our uh, six foot, seven foot normal human beings. But however, there will be a specific kafan for the child as well. The child needs to be wrapped up in a kafan. However, should not be as a formal. Merely wrap the fetus in a piece of clean cloth, give the fetus a name, and bury it without janazah salah. So the child will be given a name and uh, it will be buried. However, there will be no salatul janazah. In the case of a stillbirth where no signs of life were present at birth, although the baby will be given ghusl, the kafan again should not be as formal, merely wrap the stillborn baby in a piece of clean cloth, give the child a name and bury it without janazah salah. So if it's nine months, no physical appearance, nothing, but because it's more than four months, uh, the child will be given uh, a ghusl, a normal kafan, name will be given, but no salatul janazah. Now the last part, at time of birth, should only the head emerge and signs of life were noticeable before death. The same ruling applies as for stillborn, stillborn child. It should be noted that if more than half the body emerges and the child lives before dying, then it will be considered as if uh, born alive. Half the body implies emergence of the top a torso up to chest if I had first delivery and up to navel if feed first delivery. So now there is a whole concept of if a child was born but half of the child was born and they could, there were signs of life that he is still alive. So if half of the child is born and the child is alive then obviously Salatul Janazah will also be performed. Now these are, I'm sure it's, it's a bit like a bit like confusing because there are so many different angles to it but it's very important to understand that uh, there are many rewards and merits to a woman who gives birth to a stillborn child or a fetus or the child was born after nine months and passes away so it, it, it's I do understand it's uh, sometimes very emotional sentimental and uh, it's something where our women folk uh, uh, remembers it it's a trauma which they have to go through and it's something they have to live with as well now the last point inshallah of the hadith before we terminate is um, uh, our end which we mentioned as well the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that amila qalilan wa ujira kathiran that a person had made little action little good deeds however he was given tremendous reward because he accepted Islam and he left this world as a Muslim as well so one point I would like to mention over here and before we end Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says innam al-a'malu bil khawatim that our acts just like innam al-a'malu bin niyat indeed your actions are based on the intention similarly one hadith says innam al-a'malu bil khawatim that indeed your actions will be based with the final deeds you leave this world with innakum latamutuna kama tanamun so very important that a person will pass away how he lived in this world. So we should be very, very, very constant in making this dua and very wary as well that how we leave this world. That's why Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always used to make this dua, oh Allah give us a death on Iman. Why? Because the whole life a person could be performing good deeds and good actions. However, when leaving this world, if he is not in the right shape and form and right level of Iman, then unfortunately, uh, the repercussions and circumstances of uh, uh, which are coming ahead him would be quite uh, intensifying and very pressurizing for him as well. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we end this hadith. There were two main points highlighted in today's lesson. Firstly, the first paragraph of the hadith was highlighting the, the, uh, the inception of this human being, how wonderfully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created him. Remember the verse I recited initially, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ That indeed we have created insan in the best of the forms, in the best manner, in the best shape and structure. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds this insan that there are some aspects of your life which are already written. You do not need to be worried and concerned about. And that is the aspect of 
uh, rizq, provision, and the aspect. Now, there's a whole academic discussion about taqdeer over here, which I, which I avoided because it demands a lot of, uh, uh, mashallah, concentration as well at the same time, which is a bit difficult after uh, such a long uh, uh, session. But inshallah, we will, we will cover that inshallah in the uh, uh, other forthcoming uh, hadith. So that's about taqdeer. Nabi alayhi salam says that in this hadith, it's highlighted that however you're going to spend your life, it's written for you. Your rizq is written. Every single thing has been written. You should strive according to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gain the maximum barakah rather than avoiding and rather than, rather than tossing and toiling and, and tiring yourself behind this world whereas you will only get that much which is, which is prescribed for yourself. And the last part of the hadith, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi is highlighting that look at this, we spoke about the insan. Subhanallah again, we spoke about correlation and connection. The first part is saying this is how insan is born. This is your beginning. You are a drop of fluid. You are a flesh which has no value to it. Then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created you in this whole procedure in the womb of your mother in 120 days and the angel came and blew the ruh and blew the spirit and you had life and then too you had to go through different procedure and process and after nine months you came as a feeble weak child in this world and now Allah is speaking about the final moments of your life and he's saying that yes this is it you have to work you have to work you have to work you have to put the effort it's never done until you pass away this world and leave this world until you pass away and leave this world with la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we make dua Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us and again reiterate as my ustad mentioned that he saw in his dream after so much anxiety and having such a uh, such a uh, 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 that connection spiritual connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah gave this divine inspiration that connect yourself to the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam may Allah ta'ala grant us all the tawfiq the ability jazakum Allah khaira subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallahum wa bihamdika nashadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk